an interesting um, narrative. What, a, what an interesting story for the disciples that would become the apostles to remember and to remember enough to include it in an eternal gospel, God's Word. Now, and we'll refer to it in a minute. Matthew remembers and recalls this, this occasion as well. It's in the 15th chapter of Matthew, and if you're real interested, you can you know, keep your finger there in Mark and turn back to Matthew and look at his account, and we'll refer to it because I think when we put the two together, we can really get the um, eternal truth here that Jesus is saying. <clears throat> this miracle of healing by Jesus, many people, many scholars have said, may be one of the most significant healings that is recorded in the Gospels. And even though we don't focus on it often, uh, it was uh, very important and very strategic in Christianity to come. And I think maybe one reason we just kind of gloss over it at times is that many of us get hung up in the dialogue Jesus has with this Greek woman, uh, mostly due to some misinterpretation, and, and we neglect to see the significance of the message. But I think, and, and really the title of this message would be, uh, the, the message that's throughout this story is the persistence of love. The persistence of love. So let's look at it. And first of all, I want you to look at is that Jesus, is, Jesus has a persistence of love throughout his whole mission. Jesus continues to have a persistence of love as he lives again in our hearts and at the right hand of God. The story opens up and it says Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, we know, and I've learned again in, in really studying and, and living in the Gospel of Mark these last few months, that in, in his Gospel, Jesus travels a lot. He is always moving, isn't he? We see him on one side of the lake, and he goes to the other shore, and then he goes back to the other shore, and a lot of miracles happen on the water and on the lake. He goes up to a mountainside. He goes to this town, to this village. And so now we see him traveling once again, and Mark says he goes to this region of Tyre. Now, that's significant. I don't think any time that Jesus says, guys, let's go to this village, this town, this city, this region, uh, it is by mistake. There is a strategy. There is a strategy to this. There is something that Christ wants his disciples and wants us to know. And so now Jesus goes to Tyre, this region, and what he's doing is he's going out of Jewish territory and he's going into Gentile territory. That's a big deal, isn't it? Now, if, um, if you don't remember, the region of Tyre was one of the areas of the promised land that was promised to the nation of Israel way back when Joshua entered with the nation and started taking over the promised land that was promised to them. You remember kind of that big story, right? And you, you'll remember because one of the first battles they fought, or as the spiritual goes, they fit. They fit the battle of Jericho, didn't they? And so that's the, those are the battles that we're talking about. Well, this region of Tyre was one of those parts that were promised to one of the nations, but their armies, Joshua's army, the army of Israel, could never drive out the people there. And so they never really conquered this region with their military. They never took it over for their kingdom. And so now a region that could not be conquered for God by force, Jesus comes in and he's going to conquer it with love. There's a message in that 
right there, isn't it? What couldn't be conquered by force is going to be conquered by the love of Jesus. Now, if you remember last week or the last couple of weeks, Jesus has just, with uh, his encounter with the Pharisees and his disciples eating with unclean hands, Jesus has begun to tear down some barriers. And he just tore down the barriers of, of the Jewish customs that there, there is no difference, there is no clean and unclean foods. And we talked about that. Well, now he comes to Tyre, another region in the world, and he's going to tear down the barriers, the perceived barriers. He's going to say, in me, in my love, in my gospel, there's no unclean people and clean people. Everybody, we're going to hear in a minute, everybody is same in the eyes of God. Everyone has the opportunity for salvation. Everybody has the opportunity and is pursued by love, by a loving God. That's significant. And so Jesus enters Tyre. The Bible says he finds a house. And as often he does, he tries to find a house, go into the house to get some much needed rest. He's tired. He's weary. Everywhere he goes, he's being surrounded by people, and he's having to do something. You know, did your life ever feel like that? Everywhere you go, people demand something of you. Every minute you wake up, your, your to-do list is this long, <laughs> you know, whatever you're doing. And you know, maybe your job makes you weary. Your family can make you weary. Problems can make you weary. Something you're struggling with can make you weary. And, and Jesus was just like us. He, he needed some rest. He needed to get away. But what usually happens in the gospel is that people discover he's there. His, his uh, popularity has gone ahead of him. His healing, his teaching has gone ahead of him. And people find him, don't they? In fact, the Bible says something here that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. It says, Jesus tries to get some rest in this house, but it says... His presence could not be hidden. His presence could not be hidden. The miraculous, eternal, saving story of Jesus could not be hidden by a region, by a house, by man. That Jesus and his story, Jesus and his gospel is always going to be able to bubble up. Jesus and the, and the story of persistent love of God is going to be able to overcome, to surface. It, nothing's going to be able to hide it. Nothing's going to be able to cover it up. And we've seen that throughout history. There's no evil. Evil can attempt to hide Jesus. Evil, um, you know, can, can, can try to overpower the story of the gospel. We've seen it happen in our world history. But Jesus will be revealed. Jesus can overcome evil. We can have false religions, and, and many of them can become popular. Heresy can come up in the church, and they can attempt to hide the real Jesus, the real truth, the real gospel. But the gospel is going to prevail. Unbelief will attempt to hide Jesus. People, uh, I've seen people for years say, I just don't believe. I can't believe that. I don't have faith enough to believe that. Or I'd have to be crazy to believe that. But the truth of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the reality that the gospel is real, that Jesus is real, cannot be hidden. It's going to bubble up in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. Culture and trends can attempt to hide Jesus. We live in a culture now that says that that's starting to marginalize the importance of knowing Jesus, the importance of being involved in his church, the, uh, the importance that there's so many other things that are more important or more fun or, or more cool than Jesus. You know, why, why do we need Jesus when we have our iPhone? 
when we have our tablet, when we have our computer, when we have our games, when we have all of the leisure time that we can have now, we can go. But that is not, even our culture that's trying to push Jesus in the margins is not going to be able to hide the gospel. The persistence of God's love is going to bubble through and shine through that. Jesus will always be discovered. And you know, it's no different than this story right here, is it? Jesus tries to hide, but he's discovered. And so he gets out in the streets, it sounds like. You know he's discovered. He begins to move amidst the people. And one of the, the, the first people, persons that he is encounters is a Greek woman, a Phoenician. And the Bible says, and, and now kind of look back over into Matthew's account. Matthew says, this woman is following Jesus and his entourage, his people, you know, his boys, the disciples, and she's following uh, behind them, and she's beseeching Jesus. She's shouting at Jesus, and she keeps shouting above the crowd, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And I can just hear her saying this over and over and over again. That can be unsettling, couldn't it? Can you imagine? Someone maybe in this service continually to yell out, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of God, forgive me. That's the picture I get. She's begging Jesus to have mercy on her, to heal her daughter who has an evil spirit. We're going to see that, that she has a persistence in love too. It's the love of her daughter. It's the love of her family. She's not going to let anything get in the way of that. Now, Matthew, again, uh, gives us a little bit more to the story, and, and it tells us of the disciples' reaction to this non-Jewish woman, this Greek woman, as she continues to yell, Son of David, have mercy on me. And their reaction, their, um, what their solution to this is, they go to Jesus, they've huddled, and they urge Jesus to do what? Send her away. Yeah. Send her away. That, that's, their, that's their church. The church gets together and decides, this is disruptive. This isn't the kind of person we want in our church. <laughs> you know, are we going to put up with this? And, and their decision is, let's tell Jesus to send her away. They see her as someone they don't need to bother with. They see her as someone that's unimportant. They see someone that's not like them. Basically, they see her as a Gentile dog. They see her as a heathen, a non-believer. Are there people in our society that you instinctively think of that way? You see them as a heathen. You see them as a dog of our society. Is there a person or a group of people that, that you just maybe think, and you don't want to admit it, that's just not worthy of the gospel message? Or is, are not worthy of you going up and, and sharing your faith in Jesus with, or you don't think it's going to do any good? Are there groups of people, you, would, you know the gospel's for everybody, and you know this sanctuary's for everybody, but you really don't want to see them sitting in the pews here with you on a Sunday morning? Let's admit it. Probably so. You don't really want to be bothered by them. I think our reaction sometimes is the same as the disciples. When we hear people begging out, crying out that they need Jesus. Now, the Bible says that, that Jesus up to this point, he, he's observing all of this in silence. And he especially, I think, is watching the disciples' behavior. You see, this, Jesus sees as a teachable moment. 
It's a teachable moment about the scope of the gospel. It's a teachable moment in him going to, he's going to share. He's here for a reason. And this woman is here for a purpose. And this encounter is going to be able to show us eternal truth. And so Jesus turns to the woman, and now we can turn back to Mark. And he says to her something that at first I think we think is very puzzling or sometimes very disturbing or sometimes we scratch our heads. I said that because I had an itch. I had to scratch my head. But, but Jesus says, um, first, to this woman, first let the children eat all they want. He told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And we think, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Does Jesus not recognize this woman's need? This doesn't sound like Jesus. It almost sounds like Jesus is saying, I came only to preach and teach the, the Jews. I didn't come to preach to you Gentiles. But what we miss is I believe, and, and, and as I read and really studied this this week, is that, is that Jesus is not saying this for the woman really to hear. He's saying this for the disciples to hear. We have to imagine, and, and many people pointed this out and I had to think about it, not only what Jesus says, but we've got to imagine the tone in how Jesus is saying this. Think about the situation. I believe the tone of Jesus' voice here is just dripping with irony. It's just dripping with sarcasm. He's saying this outlandish statement so the disciples can realize how ridiculous their thoughts are, how ridiculous their actions have been, how ridiculous their suggestions have been towards this woman. It's almost as if he says to this woman and all of her needs and all of her hurt and all of her faith, I uh, will just let the children eat what they want. It's not right for the children, for the children's bread to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs, is it? And he's saying this like it's the most ridiculous statement that could be said. You've probably used that ploy before, haven't you? trying to say something that, uh, a, a statement of prejudice, a statement of ridiculousness, to let people know how stupid it sounds. That's what I think is happening here. In other words, he's saying to the disciples, listen to how you sound. He hasn't said anything up to this point, remember? Listen to how you sound when you ask me to send this person away. He's pointing out how distorted their worldview is in regards towards the gospel. And I hope the disciples at that point felt pretty small. Or maybe, as oftentimes in the gospel, they still had no clue about what he was saying. And then the story turns more between Jesus and the woman. And we see this Greek woman's persistent love as a mom, as a person. Because you know, upon hearing these words of Jesus, the woman in boldness, and actually this woman in very quick wit says back to him, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Isn't there anything for me? She's thinking of her daughter who's seriously ill. And whatever Jesus is saying, and whoever he's saying that to, doesn't matter. She does not want to take no for an answer. And I believe she recognizes the tone of Jesus' voice. And more importantly, she sees really the true love in Jesus' eyes. And he's really not putting her down. But he's really saying, I do and want and will help you. So she's pretty witty about it. She gives it right. But one of the few times, maybe the only time in the gospel, that somebody in a, in a conversation 
comes back to Jesus in boldness <laughs> and knows what's going on. And it takes this Greek woman to do it. So in order to have Jesus meet and help her daughter, she doesn't give up, but she's creative and she's persistent in getting her daughter to Jesus. And it made me think about sharing our faith. What if we as individuals and we at Fairview were this dogged, this persistent, this creative in bringing people to Jesus? It made me think, is inviting people to hear the gospel story on Sunday morning or in your small group a priority in your life? Are you urgent about sharing your faith? Or are you not taking no for an answer? Somebody, I talked to a neighbor over here Wednesday night. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if she said it just to get me off her trail <laughs> or or if she really meant it, but she said, uh, you know, looked like just the rest of us sitting, on the, sitting over there. And I said, told her about the church and come over and have a hot dog. She said, well, you know I'm Muslim. She said, my, my boyfriend's Muslim. I've kind of become Muslim. So she, it was funny. She said, I just say that because I'm not sure if you're recruiting me. I'm not sure what you call it. I said, well, I don't recruit, but I am here to tell you about the love of Jesus. But I said, um, it doesn't matter. I said, uh, I guess Muslims eat hot dog and popcorn too. Come on over and have something with us. We can't take no for an answer, can we? I think that's what this woman is saying. She's not. And Jesus, I just think, in fact, he's going to say it. He loves this woman's response. He enjoys her wit. He enjoys her persistence. And he especially honors her her love for her daughter. And he said to her in verse 29, for such a reply you may go. Can't you hear in that that he just loves what she said? For such a reply you can go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. And, and the encounter reminds us that, that Jesus loves us. The story reminds us that Jesus listens to our prayers. The story reminds us that he honors our persistence. He honors our love for our family. He honors our love for each other. He answers our prayers. And so this narrative is very important. And it may be one of the most significant miracles Jesus ever performed. Because it reminds us that Jesus hears us. He hears our pleas out of our pain and our passion and our sufferings as we go through this life. And he's going to walk with us in that. And it also reminds us that Jesus loves everyone. That the good news is for everyone. And that if you love Jesus... You love everyone, and you see everyone as somebody that needs to be brought to Jesus. Those are pretty big truths, aren't they? I remember listening uh, to an interview. I, I knew when I worked at the board, she was still living. I knew the great Virginia missionary, Alma Hunt. And in fact, uh, our state offering is named after Alma, and we'll have the Alma Hunt missions offering in September and Alma was being interviewed, and, and they were talking about the offering that had just been named for her, but they were talking to her about part of the offering that, that year was going to a group of people in our state that we were going to try to minister to and share the gospel with us. And this group of people were not like us. They were marginalized. They were in some ways controversial. And they were asking Alma, Alma, you know, why should we be spending dollars and sending people to minister to and giving our energy towards these people? And, man, she didn't hesitate. Without blinking an eye, she looked at the camera and she simply said, because a soul is a soul. And every soul is worth eternity to Jesus. A soul is a soul. 
And that's the meaning of this gospel story. You are a soul that's worthy of Jesus. And every one of your brothers and sisters here and in this world is a soul that's worthy of Jesus' love and the cross and the resurrection. So I hope you'll see and hear this story as Jesus meant it to be heard. In just a minute, we're going to have a, a prayer and, and uh, we're going to have a final song, but I really want you to take the message to heart. Have you accepted it? You know, God is pursuing you. Jesus is pursuing you with his love. Has he broken through to your heart yet? Can you believe? Can you ask him to be your savior? Can you follow him in baptism and give him your life? Or maybe many of us here I know have given Jesus our life. Can you, can you, as Jesus broke down barriers of people and gender and sex and race, can you do that? Can you begin to see people with the eyes of Jesus? Because Miss Alma's right, a soul is a soul. And Jesus died for every soul. So we can ask Christ anew in our heart today or we can commit to share Christ anew today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that uh, you love us no matter, no matter who we are, no matter um, what we've done, no matter what we're facing. Your love persists. Your love breaks through every barrier. May we accept the good news and may we share the good news. In your name we pray, amen.